Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fosperu. YouTuber Jeff Marshall is known by hundreds of thousands of train enthusiasts. His vlog style films and adventures based on Britain's railways and the London underground attract millions of hits on his YouTube channel and he's getting on for half a million devoted subscribers. Jeff held the Guinness World Record twice actually for travelling to all tube stations in the fastest time ever and a few years ago visited every one of Great Britain's 2,560 63 stations, followed by Ireland's 198, and he's performed at the Edinburgh Fringe. So when I spotted him at the Ricelip Lido Railway open evening, I couldn't resist queuing with his fans and asking if he'd record a podcast. After what felt like a thorough interview, Jeff grilling me that is, he agreed. And today Jeff's come to mine for a coffee and a chat. Jeff, thank you so much for coming today. I had to make sure you weren't like a crazy stalker fan. That's why that's why I grilled you. Is it? Yeah. And am I a crazy stalker fan? Jira's out, my friend. Ask me in 40 minutes. I'll see where we're at. <laughs> You're usually travelling around London <laughs> making fantastic films, which I've watched plenty of now, when, all over the country. When, when you say you've watched them, what, what you really mean is, is that your teenage son has watched them and you've sort of seen them as he's watched them. Is that what it is? I've seen them as he's watched them but now I've done my research you've made me look very cool to my 14 year old rail enthusiast son actually <laughs> <laughs> now you arrived on the new Elizabeth line today not not yes. so new now but what do you think to it the cross rail the, the cross Liz pur- purple train no it's great I mean obviously that has its detractors because people say it's a long time coming there are other detractors that say why does London get all the investment but you know it should be something that we should have had years ago and it is now fully up and running it took them you know a year to get it properly all running all the bits it's a worthy addition to london's transport network and one of the many things you do is you go to the stations when they're newly opened i particularly was fond of your bond street one it had a little bit of a 007 (laughs) theme going on didn't it Somebody read in the comments, why are you wearing suits and tuxedos? They didn't actually pick up on the Bond theme and I didn't, it's a bit awkward. I was like, yeah, you need to figure that one out for yourself. It was quite a clue <laughs> so, that you'd actually used a bit of the Bond theme tune. That should have right. been the giveaway. Well, yeah, but did you, did you know, because I was chatting to one of my friends, did you know, I just, sorry, we're off on a tangent already, but when we did that, one of my friends is an ardent Bond fan went, you should use one of the alternative theme tunes. And I went, excuse me, alternative theme tunes. You went, yeah, you know that like so-and-so that they wrote for Spectre, they commission artists to write a song that normally get like two, three, four, five artists all writing a Bond song and then the producers pick the best one. So there's all these other Bond songs that have been written and then never used. And you only have to go a searching on a Googling and on a YouTube and you can find all these Bond themes that were never used, but they sound like Bond themes because that's what they're written for. So I just use one that had never actually been used in a film. Really? I video. must... I'm yeah, it's a whole... It's a proper YouTube rabbit warren to go down. Really, is it? I might go down that rabbit warren. Other, it un, the, unused, just look for unused Bond themes. It is the 60th anniversary of Bond this year, actually. And we did a podcast with the art director and we're lucky enough to be able to use some Bond music. So yeah, I will go down that rabbit warren, actually. Now, before we talk about your YouTube channel, your films, your new show that you're doing, where does this love of railways come from, Jeff? Oh, man. Yeah. I would say the back of a London A to Z, which my mother's dad, granddad, had a collection of on his bookshelf. So when I was wee Jeffrey, five, six, seven, eight, I used to look at the colourful tube map on the back and note her over the years, because he had a collection going back many years, even in the 1980s, you know, probably, probably from like the 1940s or 50s. And I could see how the network had grown and changed. And then my cousins, my elder cousins, who were bus spotty nerds, used to take me out traveling to get me out from under my mum's feet on a Saturday and take me to sort of weird and wonderful places. They wanted to go bus spotting in bus garages all over London. Often to get there, the quickest way was to get there on a tube train, (laughs) not a bus. And so they used to just get me traveling. And it just got me thinking about traveling around the tube map and going to extremities. And I can remember as a 14-year-old, then when I had like paper round money and pocket money, being in London with my friend Simon, we were in HMV buying records to being desperately cool. And then suddenly I was just like, do you want to go to Chesham or Amersham? And he's like, where's that? I went, it's at the end of the Metropolitan Line. And we just jumped on the train and just went and did it for the heck of it. Just because, you know, we only used to like hang out in central London. And part of me just thought one day, what's the extremities of the tube map? Not just the bit in the middle. And I think it sort of, sort of went, I think went, went from there. Railways <laughs> have a, a fascination, particularly with boys of that age. This isn't the tube, but 
Jack's heading next weekend to Littlehampton because he wants to see a particular engine. There's something about being 14 and the freedom, isn't there, that the rail network and, and the tube network gives, I suppose. Um, yeah, I remember being 15 or 16 and my mum was like, OK, you're sort of old enough now to go off and do your own thing. That's interesting. That So for you, Jack's 14. I think my mum waited till I was 15. I remember getting a train to Liverpool one day, just from Euston up to Liverpool, got there, spent an hour there. And then just came back again. It was mad to think I'd just been to Liverpool for the day. And now I think, I was only 15. I'm not sure if I'd let my 15-year-old go out for the day to Liverpool from London, but my mum let me. So I'm not sure who paid for it either, but it was fun. And what was it then in those days, do you think, that captivated you, particularly with the tubes and the underground? No, it's always a sense of, because you only know your bit. So you know your street. You know, you're allowed to play outside with your mates or you walk to school, you get the bus to school or then you get a bike, don't you? And you, you explore a bit on a bike. And I can't remember my parents saying, you know, right, we're going to set like the boundary, you know, don't go beyond here on your bike. And I think I even sort of like drew an, an area with a pencil in, in the A to Z. And then I think, you know, when you're told, you know, don't go further than a mile from home, you start to think, I really want to go further than, you know, than a mile from home. And you start to think, well, I started to like cycle a long way away from home on purpose, you know, just to be like, oh my God, how far can I push myself to feel safe from home? And then put that onto transport and you just think, well, how far can I go by bus or train? And then literally realise there's a whole country and a whole world out there to explore. And I guess you just kind of want to explore it. But what's different, Jeff, about you is that lots of young people probably have adventures on the tube and love the railways. You've turned yours into... Well, into your job, really. I mean, your films are loved on your YouTube channel. What made you start doing them in the first place? Because in its early days, in its infancy, YouTube wasn't, it was just a lot of people uploading clips. Or sometimes people would just sort of go and get static shots with their VHSC or 8mm cameras and then just dump them down. And the idea of actually slickly producing stuff took a while to gain traction, traction, pun intended. I'd had a blog where I wrote about the underground and I had photos, but I just, I think when YouTube started to become into its prime, I remember thinking, I want to watch some quality YouTube footage about the underground. And there wasn't really any there. And either my girlfriend at the time, or I said it, or she encouraged me. And I, I said, well, I'm going to go out and sort of start making some of these videos. So I, I then just started doing it. So I made the content that I wanted to see because nobody else was making it, which sounds a little bit big headed, doesn't it? No, <laughs> but it, it, it is true. Big-headed, but there, is, there was nothing really <laughs> out there like that. I, and, and lots of people are across Britain, love our railways and trains and all that kind of thing. How would you describe your films to people who haven't seen what you do? For me, you're a storyteller and that's what I like about them, that there's always a story. Just to make sure I'm absolutely correct here and on, on the money. I love the hobby of train spotting and train enthusiasts. I'm in no way sort of being dissentful and putting it down. But a lot of train enthusiasts do just stand on the edge of a platform and get a shot of a train going by, and then a shot of a get the train going by, and then a shot of a train going by. And they just, it's 20 minutes of just trains going by, which is great. And it's cool. And it's interesting. And it's a record and stuff. But yeah, it doesn't actually tell a story, <laughs> does it? So that's got limited appeal. Because if you want to see 20 minutes of trains going by, you can just stand on the edge of a platform and watch trains going by. And growing up, as I did, I had worked at the BBC for many years. The BBC was very much like when you watch the news, it's like, you know, and -and so-and-so, we go to uh, this place for a report from so-and-so about this thing. And they do their two-minute package. And I just thought, well, you should start to make short, interesting videos, maybe sort of with a BBC-style news report, but about trains. And then that later then, which is what I did when I made my first videos, but then in just sort of the general YouTube culture world, the idea of a vlog came along. And for many years, people that had a blog, a web log, where they wrote about their day or their experiences with with photos and words. But then people started to do on YouTube vlogs, which is, was a, literally a video narrative of their day, which you know, told a story arc of their day. And what I found myself starting to do was like, well, you could go out for a train trip and you could just do it as a vlog style thing, like I'm going out for a ride. But what if you actually combine the two things? So you set it up as a, I'm going to go out and do this thing. But then you also mixed it with, you know, standard BBC News style reporting, you know, nice cutaways and, you know, interviews, static shots, captions, and then a bit of a vlog style. The video I always try to make is a vlog video, but with new style packages, bits thrown in with a narrative arc so that you are actually going somewhere to do something, to discover something or see something and actually have a purpose. And people who don't get to go out and do that can then see that story and enjoy that story. And also interesting facts. You learn things from them and 
there's, there's interesting. That's what I love. It's that newsy thing. I think the perfect video I make is where, uh, you know, you set it up. You're like, right, there's a new thing we're going to go and do. And everyone goes, oh, there's a new, there's a new station or there's a new train. And then you sort of have a bit of a vloggy video. You sort of see the ticket buying or the which train or the changing or, or getting there. And then you get there and then you actually like, oh, and here's actually some of like the pack of content. Oh, that's a new thing. Or I've not seen that before. Or here's the stuff. And then you go, right, and now for some facts. And then you like give them like, I bet you didn't know this. But also it's like, oh, whilst we're here, we've also discovered this and here's a new thing. And everyone goes, oh, there's a new thing we didn't discover. And then you chuck in a bit of humor and you go, right, now we're going to do a silly thing. And so you just do like a perfect blend and then you don't forget to wrap it up to like end your story to be like, right, and now we're going home and that was our day out so and so so it's a perfect blend of many things if you try and do that every time then you've made a perfect video which people hopefully want to watch it's, it's a mix of journey travel information news humor which is entertainment in a package we'll talk about some of the adventures you've had in a minute sure. but just sticking with youtube how did it get so popular jeff and how did you grow those numbers did that happen organically how did i do it yeah, how did your YouTube channel get so popular? No idea. No idea. <laughs> Good. Gonna, That's probably on. a very honest answer. Here's a rustling noise as I adjust the mic. Like, there we go. The story I always tell is that I remember I got to 3,000 subscribers without trying <laughs> or without looking. And I say that with a chuckle in my voice because I know that there are some lovely, beautiful people that are like, we want to get to 100 subscribers or we want to get to 1,000 subscribers and they never managed to do it. And it sounds a bit brazen of me to be like, yeah, I got to 3,000. But I wasn't aware of what that was. I didn't really understand the concept of like, subscribers or the fact that that was important and then one day one of my friends went you got 3,000 subscribers and I went is that good I had no idea <laughs> I had no idea at all and they went particularly as you haven't tried and I went well what if I started trying and so I then just started to try and make more quality stuff what I definitely did was look at my own stuff and then I used to look at old stuff and think that's a bit rubbish and I basically just used to analyze my old stuff and think how can I make that better? How can I make that better? Or I looked at what other people were doing and was like, okay, there's an idea or there's a stylistic choice or that's a good edit sequence or there's a clever thing they do there or I like that technique. And I incorporated some of those things and still got it wrong. And then over time, just continually, continually, continually tried to polish and improve and polish and improve and improve and improve and do nice graphics and maps and bought a better microphone and bought a better camera and just improved everything. So slowly it just became more and more polished, I guess. And with that, you raise the level of quality. And I guess with that, people watch it more. So, but I'm not being big headed. I sometimes still get it wrong and I sometimes still make mistakes and, and I still look at things and think, how can I make that better? I don't want to rest on my laurels. Is, it, in, is, that, is that the phrase? Resting yeah, on my laurels. Yeah, rest on your laurels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think in this day and age, nobody will be shy of telling you if they think you've got it right. wrong. Oh, the comments. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> there are plenty yeah, of comments yeah, 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 going man. on. I just kept making stuff, and which I like to think is of a decent enough standard that it attracts people to come back so and is it exciting to see those numbers grow i think actually you've used the word humbling before to begin with i did what everybody does you fall into the trap of being obsessed by your numbers because basically youtube give you a, a silver plaque at a hundred thousand so it kind of becomes this what's the expression where the, there's a weight around your neck the millstone around your neck and you're like you're weighed down by the prospect like will i ever get to a hundred thousand and then you get then you're like, yay. And then for some reason, a quarter of a million, 250, 250K was a bit of a thing. Honestly, in the last six months, past 300,000, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't, I just, I stopped fixating on that and worrying about it. And I just focused on making content and enjoying making that content and making good content. And if you do that, then the numbers will come. If you spend all your time fixating on the numbers, then that's energy and effort that you're not expending on making a quality video. As a broadcaster, I can see how much work goes into those films and there's an awful lot of work. It's They, they really are great and informative and, and great fun. Thank you. And looking through your adventures, I'd love to ask what inspired you to go to every station <laughs> in Britain and Ireland <laughs> a few years ago. What was the idea behind that? Uh, Brexit. <laughs> 2016, when I'm old and I write my memoirs, that was an appalling year. I think everybody had an appalling year. David Bowie was to blame. On the second cold week of January 2016, we woke up to the appalling news that David Bowie had died. And it like triggered a whole set of events, right? That year, I think then uh, Alan Rickman died and Victoria Wood died. I think was that Terry Wogan and Paul Daniels uh, and all these big, I think that was just after George Michael, Christmas 2015. I think Prince and Whitney had gone the year before. And suddenly you were like, could everybody just stop dying, honestly? And people were being taken in their 50s and 60s and not their 70s and 80s, which just seemed wildly unfair. 
And it just kind of like put this whole gloomy stance on the whole 2016. And I think I genuinely felt a bit like depressed by it. And what's hilarious, I always quote this, I've got part run statistics where I've done weekly part run 5Ks over the last 10, 12, 13 years. And 2016 is on average my slowest, it's my worst year for part running. It was as if like I didn't have the energy or inspiration to go running. And it's some of my worst times in 2016. It just felt like there was this heavy, gloomy cloud all over Asked the world in 2016. Then Brexit happened. Then Trump happened. And it was like, can 2016 get any worse? You know, it was just awful. And myself and Vicky were sat at home, we're sort of in the well, September, October, November of 2016. And basically it was like, everything just seems a bit shit at the moment. What can we do to make things, life and the world a little bit less shit? That's two bleeps. Sorry. <laughs> Did that so intentionally. No, but genuinely. So that came from a genuine place of like, Everything's just so awful. <laughs> what can we do? We sat around one night, one Sunday evening in about November having dinner, going, we should do like a thing or just a big project to cheer ourselves up. And I said something like, well, you know, I went around all the tube stations thing. And one of us said it. They went, yeah, let's just go around all the stations in Britain kind of thing. And I did know of somebody else, one of my friends, a train driver that had once the idea of doing this many years ago. And I went, oh, there is the idea of, you know, going around all the stations in, in Britain. And Vicky jumped in it. She was like, what's that? And what started off as a jokey conversation, midweek, we went out with some friends and we were just having drinks before and in the cinema and it got mentioned. It was one of those things and we just kept mentioning it and kept mentioning it and kept mentioning it. And after about a month, we keep mentioning this thing that we should go and do. Maybe we should go and do it. And then it was, well, how would we actually do that then? And the idea of crowdfunding and stuff came up and then a name and a logo. I knew that we were in when in December, 2016, we registered the website, all the stations KUK and we bagged the Twitter handle. And at that point it was like, all oh, right. We might have to go and do it. <laughs> so you it, did it. So how long did it take you? Oh. What were the highlights? You know, what was the best station, the smallest, the worst? What What are the yeah. real memories of yeah. this incredible trek? Yeah. So 2017, all the stations from May through August, 12 weeks with like a week off and a couple of sporadic days off in between. Yeah. 2,563 stations we went to or through. We didn't get out at all of them, but we were on trains that stopped at all of them or for request stops, trains that were scheduled to stop at request stops, should anybody request it. So yeah, every station in Britain, that was intense. Did you enjoy it? An insane amount. Were there any real standout moments, Jeff, that you really look back on and think that was fantastic? Yeah, but what well, the trouble is, I can't go anywhere in Britain on a train without remembering that I've previously been there <laughs> <laughs> and who I was with and what I did and how that was like a magnificent time of my life. And the engagement that we had with people and I think the enjoyment that we brought to others and we had our Have an Adventure weekend and other people went out and took photos and stuff. And we discovered little pokey stations. I remember discovering Kim Junction Halt down on the Loo Branch in Devon for the first time. I remember going to Netherton up in Cumbria for the first time when we gathered all our friends, 20 people at Shippy Hill on June the 3rd. 2017, it was the most people that had been at you know, the station in one go, had beaten the previous record, and that made the BBC News. We got on the BBC Red Sofa couch with Dan and Naga, and that was fun. And my mum was like, you're on BBC Breakfast? I was like, I oh, know. <laughs> it's like, it's like it's mad, right? I remember going up the Saturn and Carlisle line just in this dramatic, windswept, rainy day, uh, any of Scotland, going to Corral the first time. Oh, God, it's all good. It's all good, Helen. It's like none of it was terrible. What's terrible is just thinking back and thinking, how can I ever surpass that? Might that have been the greatest time slash experience of, of my life? The uh, planning side. Did you do all that planning then yourselves, you and Vicky? To some extent, yes. Uh, to a lot of extent, no. <laughs> we <laughs> had a lot of help from friends. This is a, a thing I often um, say a lot. People are very kind to me. Thank you, kind people that are kind to me. When they go, oh, Jeff, you know everything about trains and do you know about how to get here or what the best ticket is for that and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, people very often ask me questions. And I always have to say, it's like, you know, I don't know everything. I'm obviously, I'm extremely keen. And yes, I have a, a wide understanding, but I would never profess to knowing everything. But what I do have is an extensive network of friends that I can meet up or text. And between us all, yeah, I bet we know everything. Because <laughs> I know someone that's well into their timetables and someone that knows all about the rolling stock. And I know someone that knows about train stock movements. And I know someone that just likes, likes liveries and patterns and stuff. And, and, and yeah, and amongst the whole gang of us, a gang of us beautiful nerds, We've probably got all all sort of topics covered. And so it was quite easy to go to my spreadsheet nerd loving timetabling friend, Dave, and be like, right, we got a plot a route around Britain. And he's like, 
right, <laughs> big task. I'm like, I know. <laughs> and there was a lot of back and forth in the like January, February, March in the build up to it. In effect, we had a test run. We, we had a database which then wrote out to a map so we could see a map of Britain to see which bits we've done to, to see which bits were left outstanding so that we knew in our planning which stations we'd done and which we hadn't. And once we found a way to get around them all, we refined it a little bit and sort of switched that day for this day and stuff. And to be honest, when we started in May, we'd only got up to about week 10 because by then we'd got up to Edinburgh and Scotland was fairly easy to plan. But it was England where most of the troublesome, tricky stations were. But I'm very grateful to him and I'm very grateful to another friend of mine called Dave that knows a lot about trains and just everybody that pitched in. People just saw Vicky and me doing it, but there was a lot of people working diligently behind the scenes. That's a fantastic yeah. achievement, as was yeah. your Guinness World Record. You've got that twice, haven't you, for travelling to sure. all the tube stations sure. in the fastest time possible. Sure. Tell me about that challenge and sometimes, how you did that. Sometimes that seems like another world and another lifetime because I was, a, I was a young man in his 20s back then. Were you just um, in your 20s? I didn't realise you were in your 20s when you did that. I think so. I don't know. What, I, I, maybe, my, maybe my 30s. Sure. So should very stringently point out now, don't hold the world record now. Some other people I know do. They got it down to like 15.45. Hang on. So 15.45 hours. 15 hours, 45 minutes is the current record for 270 stations, I believe. What's really interesting about that is that the Battersea Power Station's Nine Elms extension opened, took it from 270 to 272 stations. And no one apparently has set a record time in the new 272 configuration because Guinness World Records are being slightly fastidious in the rules that you must adhere to to do that. So would that tempt you to no, give it another go? No, no interest. No interest at all <laughs> because I feel like it was something that I did. I've, sorry, I haven't actually explained what it was, but it's definitely something that I've did and I've done and I'm thrilled to have done it and obviously proud of my achievement. It's great that other people are doing it and getting times and having a go and having that fun. It was, it was something that I did and I've moved on because I'm just doing other things now. So, so what was the motivation at the time behind it? What gave you the idea yeah, and how I, did you do it? I read an Evening Standard article back in about 2003, back when, you, when the Evening Standard used to cost 25p about somebody that had just set the record time. And then somebody actually wrote a fictional novel about somebody getting around to doing it called Tunnel Vision. And that made me think I should have a go at this. Again, said it in passing to one of my friends one day that thought that might be interested. And before I know it, we'd all fired ourselves up to have a go at getting around the network. And that was the first time I ever did, I think back in 2002, three. Is the route key as well, plotting your route in terms extremely, of speed? Extremely, extremely key. Yeah, yeah. The first time we got the record, was it 2003, four? Goodness, I can't even remember. We did it in like 18 hours or something. That was back when it was all very much on paper. There were paper timetables and we had paper maps and paper notebooks and written down times. And by the time we did it in about 2014, you could then export TFL's timetable data in a database format, convert that to XLS or a CSV. And we import it into like a number crunching generator program written by my cool, clever friend, Kirk. You'd come up with a route you'd insert the route into the program and it would think about it and then spit out how long that route should take you. So we just kept firing routes at it and it then spat out, spat out routes, spat, 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 spat. And it just automated the process. And there were like four routes. One of these four was going to be the fastest. It just depends on the day where the trains turned up or not. And we just sort of went, well, pick that one. Let's pick route number two and did it. And, and it worked. That's yeah. very cool, isn't it? To hold a Guinness world record. Sure. Well, did, yeah. you did, obviously. You did. As you say, you don't now, but it must have been well, great to you know, be awarded that but what, title. But, what, but watch me be humble. And I do mean this, yeah. It's not, it's not like I'm a doctor saving lives, though. You know, it's not like I'm a volunteer charity worker, like helping homeless people off the street. It's that's, not like you're a podcast host like me. <laughs> sure, you know. Be, I was trying to be funny and I shouldn't be funny, no, I know, it, I? Because I'm not. <laughs> I, I always have this immense thing of like, yeah, I get what I do is fun and I run around, but I just, I always think there's more worthy things in the, in the world that I could be doing. But I'm grateful for the fact that there are other people that do those worthy things. But I also understand that because I do these crazy things, that does bring enjoyment and inspire others to also get out and have their own fun. And that's that's important too. But, you know, sometimes I do think, should I have just studied harder and become a doctor? No, I don't think you should have done that. <laughs> Sticking with the tube. The tube holds a real fascination with me. Now, I am old enough to really long for those days yeah. of the paper yeah. map and I yeah. like you a lot of the yeah. you look great 77 by the way thanks yeah. very much yeah, that's well, really that kind great, yeah. you look great as yeah. well for yeah. that kind yeah. of age 20, 29 uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. is there a whole <laughs> labyrinth of secret stuff uh -huh. in the tubes going on underground are there disused stations oh, sure, yeah. what's going on under uh, there give me a little flavour depending on how you define the definition there's around, I think it's 48, there's around 50 disused slash abandoned stations. 
But some have just had their platforms moved and some have been demolished with no existence. So some are still there, just abandoned and disused. But even like a lot of stations in central London, like Knightsbridge or Hyde Park Corner, for example, which have nowadays have modern day escalators, just used to have lift shafts because before escalators were invented in, I think, 19... 19- 31 used to get from the street to the platform via a lift. So, so many central Zone 1 tube stations have old, dusty, abandoned corridors which were disused the minute they installed escalators and turned off the lifts and there's abandoned lift shafts. And the greatest story that I like to tell, which is a bit of an urban legend, but I really want to believe is true, is that the lift shafts at Holborn tube station supposedly have been used by military, army, SAS, you know, for a bit of like nighttime abseiling, you know, because it's like, hey, lads, we got a 60-foot lift shaft here want to go abseiling down it in the pitch black and they go sure and that's part of their training i cannot 100 percent say if that's true but don't you just want that to be true wow i do want that <laughs> yeah, to be know. true but <laughs> also are the ones that are preserved yeah. that you can go and visit yeah. or yeah they're all out there so for many years there were a lot of unofficial tours and then the transport museum did slightly more official tours and right now they actually run a program called hidden london which is like pucker let's you know sell tickets put high visits on give you all the torture and take people down there so for three years between i think 2016 to 19 i worked as the lead guide for hidden london taking people down so yeah i've been inside Aldwych and down street and can't think of the other locations <laughs> where i went and Char- oh, charing cross and, and highgate and stuff yeah and there's there's loads out there and they continue to sort of do tours and stuff What's the best bit though, Jeff? If you're down there, wet my appetite because I kind of want to go and do one of these tours. What's you know, the, you know what I want? No, you what, no. What's yeah. the highlight? You know, what's the best thing that you think you can see that you've the, never seen? My favourite was always Albridge because it's in fairly good condition because it was always lightly used. It's near the Strand, little shuttle branch off of Holborn. It only closed as recently as the 1990s. There's two platforms. One of those was closed since 1910. Now, the train sadly isn't there anymore because they've had to remove it, I believe. But there was this brilliant moment where you just sort of walk down this old tiled corridor, up some steps, turned, and you were on this long curving platform. And there was a preserved tube train, you know, from the 1950s just sat there. And there's this desolate, quiet, empty tube platform with its original tiles and a sign. And then that cool, slightly damp air that you get on the tube. And it was just, it's like really incredible to be there. Actually, some of my favorite moments when I was being a tour guide is that you'd spend all day at a tube station, you'd do four tours two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and you have a break at lunchtime, obviously. And um, sometimes you just used to go and sit on the platform at lunchtime in your break, just be like, no one knows we're down here. And it's dead quiet. Is that a mouse or a rat in the distance in the tunnel you can hear kind of thing? You know, or way down the tunnel, you can hear the chung 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 of the Piccadilly line at Holborn, you know, and all the wind blows through. And it's just, yeah, you feel like you're in a very special secret part of London. Down Street is also amazing. It's filthy dirty. You're in these little tiny little corridors and dusty rooms because... Churchill used it as a secret bunker during the Second World War. And that's just fabulous to be in. There's a bit on that tour. They warn you, they give you torches. They're like, right, we're going to turn off our torches now. And it's like pitch black. (laughs) It's just like you and your torch. It's a really kind of exciting moment. So that's where Churchill... They used the the Railway Executive Committee who coordinated Britain's railway movements during the Second World War all came together and they used the abandoned Down Street tube station to coordinate the movement of troops by railway during... World War Two, and when you go to the down street, uh, we tell you the, the story of how that happened and take you to some of the rooms. And there's like old radio equipment down there and all, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's cool. It's got such a rich heritage, yeah. and I think what it's really great. helped bring it to life for me, as you know, I have a little train geek of my own living in this household. Yeah. Is we met somebody from the London Transport Museum who invited us to the depot at Acton, which is about a mile from where I live. And I had no idea it was there. How can you not know that it was there? I didn't know it was, it was there. It was literally but what a, there at the weekend. But what a fascinating place. Did you go? Place. Yes, I've been. I went about six months ago. Oh, so like at the end of last year? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Loved it. We should go hang out. We should go and hang out. Bring, we we came away with a... Bring your son. We came out with a moquette cushion because yeah, Jack I, likes his moquette. Yeah. I noticed <laughs> you've got your moquette socks on. Yes, I have now, right now. Are they the... New Elizabeth I'm line. I'm wearing my Elizabeth line socks. Elizabeth right line I'm so casual, socks. listener, in Helen's studio. I've kicked off my shoes and I'm just sprawling on the floor with my socks around my ankles. Yeah. It's actually got one sock half off, I'm actually. So it's, it's feeling very, very anyway. relaxed. My ankle's a bit sweaty. <laughs> oh, nice. Thanks <laughs> my, for telling me that. My ice water's run out. It's good. <laughs> Hang on, have mine. Here so the moquette the, is well, the. Give me your water. Give me my water. I haven't had any of oh, that. Sure. So the moquette's the sure. pattern, isn't it? It's, the, mm. it's that unusual fabric that's used on the tube. It's feels quite coarse fabric, but I you know love what, all the patterns and colours. Do you know what maquette means? No. French word for carpet. Is it? Yeah. It is like carpet, <laughs> isn't yeah. it? Because it's a rugged material. If you go to New York, New York, you get like a hard plastic orange seat, right? Yeah. 
here in the tube, you get a nice little cosy, comfy, carpeted seat. Moquettes. Although it's, even though the moquettes have become thinner in recent years, but it's become part of the tube's design idiom. You know, it's like, yeah, it's a classic thing. It's to like, what maquette is the new train going to have? Did the new DLR train the other week. And when we got there, we were like, oh, of course, it's going to have a new maquette. We're and this is a maquette designer. Yo, oh, yeah. Yeah, his name's Paul. I've met him. There's a whole team and they sit there and they literally sketch and they come up with designs and they talk it through and stuff, you know. So like for the new, the new maquette for the new DLR trains, they wanted to reflect that it is in the dock lands part of London, you know, with famous docks and ships and stuff. They've incorporated a triangle, which is meant to represent a sail of a ship into the maquette. And it's really subtle. But when someone points it out to you, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's really clever. <laughs> it's really good. It's quite good, isn't it? <laughs> now what's good when you go to that Acton Museum, and I'll tell you up on that offer, we'll go and hang really? out there, we'll is that you're looking back at maybe the last hundred years or whatever, and they've got the tube that the Queen drove so, when the Victoria Line opened. They've, they've got, got buses too, by the way. Buses, and, and trams, signaling. And tank signaling. It's not just check trains. No, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's really, really cool. I really enjoyed the open day. But I wondered, what do you think, Jeff, to our rail network as a country? And we've got HS2 coming now, in oh, various yeah. stages of being built. Are you going to ask me if I'm pro HS2 or not? No, but do you think that we're lagging behind a bit or do you think there's an exciting new world coming now with, with the high-speed trains and electrification and all that kind of thing? I mean, I'm just, it will be no surprise to you, I'm just an advocate of railways and rail travel. So I would always be in favour of like, yes, add a new station. Yes, add another line. Yes, let's have a high-speed line because, you know, it's a very green way of travelling. As long as it's done right, and I understand that there are issues over like, you know, how building is done and how much money is spent. But I'd easily rather see a new railway than a, than a new road. The fumes you're putting into the air are less. And you can, if done properly, get to places quicker by rail than you, than you can by car. So why wouldn't you want a new railway? One of your favourite films that you made is the film about how a train ride makes everything better. Oh, no. And I say that because that film really resonated with me. I <laughs> love being on a train. It does, doesn't it? Make everything better. You can think, you can take a bit of time for yourself, you can relax. There's no stress of driving. Why is your head in your hands now? Because I'm waiting. I don't know what you're going to ask next. I wasn't really. I was just saying I like that one. Well, you, and as actually, a, well, as a professional podcast hoster, you should be asking me a deep point. point okay, move, so the deep move, thing is moving question. Okay, come on, so, soul searching. All right, dig in, Helen. So dig mental in. health was at the heart of that film, wasn't it? Yes. Come on, now as a podcast guest, you can't give me a one word <laughs> answer. <laughs> That's the yes or no uh, aren't the so questions. So why, did, why did you make that film? Why did I make that film? It was moving. I was very fond of that film. It's good to have a variation. If I forever just make fun films that are like, well, hey, here's Jeff doing a thing on a train and we do that, and then it all becomes very samey. So I partially was motivated because, yeah, I wanted to throw a curveball in. I wanted people to go, wow, what is this? I meant to be like, that's not a normal Jeff thing. Secondly, I did start making that film in January and February when it was just dark and as gloomy as heck outside. And I was on a southeastern train one night in an empty carriage by myself. And I suddenly envisaged somebody and I was sat there feeling not the happiest. And then I suddenly imagined somebody filming me. And then I was like, oh, I mean, that could be like black and white. And then you know, some deep, depressing music. And then the idea of just making that film popped up in my head. And then I thought, but what would be the point of making a deep, depressing film? The answer is to link it to making it an advert that says how train journeys for some people are important and there are people that you can talk to. So even if you are feeling like everything is a bit SHIT, then it doesn't necessarily have to be. So I'm still not sure I nailed it properly, but I like the fact that I made something a little bit different, which hopefully would have resonated with at least some people. And I think it's interesting to show that I'm not just always bouncing around like Tigger going, woohoo, and being excited. You know, there's more sides to me than I thought that was a very yeah. special film, actually. So, I, I really yeah. enjoyed that. And I do yeah. enjoy that. Yeah, well, then how come a million people didn't watch it? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, now we're getting obsessed with our numbers yeah. again. Which, yeah. I would love to make more films like that, but they take time. And also, they don't do that well because people just want to know about new trains and new stations. So I have to think about, you know, the monetization side of YouTube and Google. And if I could just spend my life doing that, yeah, I, yeah, I could make arty films for the rest of my life, probably. But then I'd probably get bored doing that. You know, if I had a channel which just made arty films, I'd probably reverse engineer it and just occasionally throw in a curveball of making like a fun, lighthearted film just to keep everybody on, on their toes. Yeah, just like mix it up now and then. You're keeping yourself on your toes because you've got a new show, which I don't know anything about other than that. <laughs> I think you're performing it tonight, aren't you? 
Or are you rehearsing tonight? When's this podcast going out, Helen? Oh, actually, they, no, actually, I can't do that, can I? Because it's no, not you don't, been don't, out for a couple of weeks. Don't look at him. Note to the editor, uh, leave this part of the podcast in, because it's funny. Now that I've done this... it's funny now. Now that I've left in this anecdotal note, you have to. Go yeah. on, then. Okay. So my new show. <laughs> Tell me fine. about your new show. I wrote a new show to lift me out of my January and February gloom. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. What's it about, obviously, other than railways, I'm guessing? In 2014, early 2014, I was invited to do like a seven minute, turned into a 10 minute spot on just, I, I can't even remember where it was. It wasn't particularly a comedy night. It was like, come and do a talk, Jeff, about your tube challenge exploits. And I did it and I did like a little 10 minute spot. And one of my friends saw it and they went, you should do like a, that as a longer spot and at like an improv comedy night. I did like a 20 minute set. And then basically like I said it or my friend Dan said it, it was like, there's clearly enough material here to turn this into, into like an hour stand-up show and if you have an hour then that's a classic like edinburgh style show so march april 2014 i applied to edinburgh i went i'd like to come do a show please and i had until august to like get it done and finished and i actually previewed it at the transport museum in july i did a 10 night run in august 2014 it was called tube spotting and it was the story of how i got the world record twice and all the fun and games and ups and downs and things that went with it and it was quite funny i did it a few more times after edinburgh and then i sort of stopped it in about 2015 you know then we all got depressed because 2016 brexit and then we did all the stations 2017 and i was busy getting divorced uh, and so off, off the back of that i was like uh, oh should go and uh, just need something else to do <laughs> and i think around the beginning of this year. I made a joke about something and then I realised that I was down the pub with my friends telling anecdotes about ridiculous things that had happened when you put yourself on YouTube and, and all the stuff that goes with it in the world of making videos and tube trains and stuff. In the back of my head, I was like, yeah, there's enough material for a show here, isn't there? <laughs> so I just started jotting down a few notes and then in sort of March, April of this year, it was like, okay, I'm actually going to write this properly now. And I sat down and I fashioned it into something. So yeah, so weirdly tonight, on the day that we're recording this, I'm doing a little tell me if it's any good or not preview to some of my friends. And then based upon their feedback, I'll polish it and then, you know, go and take it to a theatre somewhere or maybe Edinburgh next year. Being on stage is just like doing a live video. It's fun to make a video, but if, if you're on stage, then your audience like you, which hopefully they do, otherwise they wouldn't turn up. Then it's like, oh, then you, you get to entertain people live. It feels as well like you're a natural born performer and that that comes easily to you standing up and obviously thought out material. Mm. But I can imagine you probably thrive on that, do you, in that kind yeah, of but, live environment? Sure, but let's be honest, it's not a big headed thing. You know, if I'm saying something that people enjoy and is entertaining, then they're getting something out of it too. And often I try and engage with the audience or have some sort of audience participation. Let's face it, the world is a mucked up place with lots of depressing, terrible things and people don't have money and, and, and there's war going on and, and politics is dividing us. So it's good to get out and laugh and be entertained and have some fun. And there are people that do that and I enjoy doing that. And if people enjoy seeing me do that and be part of it, then that's not a bad thing. We need that in our lives. We yeah. do need that in our lives. And when you do take it to a theatre, I'll come and watch it. I'm going to make sure that I'm not no, on the won't. front row or the second row. I will. You'll be a fangle at the front. Fangle, oh, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Oh, Jeff, 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 Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> what, like I was at the Rice Light -like Railway? Oh, so, my goodness. Bring your son. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Can I just say that my 14-year-old Jack is quite distraught that he's at Ooh. school sitting an exam today and mm. you are sitting. I never do a podcast at home. You're sitting. Hang on, where do you normally do podcasts? Well, on location or remotely or wherever, but I've never actually done one at home in the living wow. room with us both sitting on the floor. We had our takeaway coffees, didn't we? You had your bit of carrot cake. In my socks. In your, in your moquette socks, which moquette have been half socks. on, half on. I'm a bit sad you've not brought me any moquette socks. Oh, would you? Oh, I could have brought you socks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, don't hang worry, on. it's fine. Wait, no, where's my gift for being on your podcast? He's distraught that I'm here and he's missing it. He's distraught that Let's he's missing it. But we'll take a picture to prove that I'm here. We'll take a picture. But what I wanted to say is thank you oh, is that for it? being so. No, that's it. No, I've got, got more. Have you got more? What else do you want to tell <laughs> oh, me? No, hang on, what time is it? Oh, I just thought. Okay, no, I'm aware that you're doing your show tonight. No, we, no I, oh, if you're wrapping it up, that's no, fine. No, but unless you've got any other kind of stories. I know you could talk so I know you could talk You could talk forever. It's been really good fun, but you've made me look the coolest mum. By saying yes to doing the podcast. That's why you got me in. No, because you're very interesting. <laughs> and I like rail. And as you know, I host rail conferences as you well. Well, I didn't know that until you told me before. Yes, I yeah, do. I, I host like, three major rail conferences. 
on and Britain's Railways. And you've never been to Nuclear Station. I've never <laughs> been, but that's on my list of things to do. And it's honestly, it's been great fun. And I promise you, I will, I'd love to come to your show, but I'm not going to be too near the front you, so you, that you don't drag me into you, the content. You, you, you didn't ask what it was called. Go on then, what's it called? You didn't go ask me. Oh, ask you just, what's, uh, what's your new uh, show called? So we're calling it World's Biggest Tube Nerd. <laughs> it's a tube themed comedy show. But how do you manage to put the tube at the centre of all that comedy? Come, come see the show. Come and see the show. There it's, we go. I've somehow managed to intertwine tube facts and nerdery and playfulness with, with stand-up style anecdotes and, and comedy and a music and a song. And, and, a and a quiz. And a quiz. And a quiz. So, yeah, yeah, and a bit of sketch comedy and a guest appearance and maybe a bit of piano playing too. Well, your come. new show sounds fantastic. It's, and I am really looking. I will genuinely come. I'm looking forward you're to very that. Kind. You're good, very, you're good. Very kind. You have been listening. So I was going to wrap you is up. It, am I wrapping you up? No, I just want to say ride trains, people. Trains are good. We need more trains. Ride tubes, ride buses, ride big trains. Get out there, explore. Literally have fun, have an adventure, meet people, take photos, enjoy, share, travel, experience, see the world. It can be done cheaply ish and just you know trains are good and thank you for having me you are very welcome and if you do want to find jeff's films i mean i just google jeff marshall and it all pops up so i hope that's the right way of instructing people to find your films jeff you have been listening to youtuber jeff marshall talking all things trains tubes and railways and lots of other things as well mixed in i haven't decided which is staying in yet and which are being edited out we'll take a look at that when we listen back hey don't forget to download our series at convex.podbean.com or search the convex conversation on spotify stitcher apple and google podcast wherever you listen to yours.